I welcome Dennis Rothman for this podcast. This is a kind of a podcast where I'm demystifying something called as deep learning, which nobody has really experienced today. From a man who has seen it grow from its stone age, he has been seeing how this technology has been evolving. He also has worked on chatbots, NLP, AI. You know, he has also written books on transformers. He has also a book on explain of expandable AI and also. lot of things so it's been a roller coaster journey for me to start my journey in ai because i used to learn something and i used to say okay never going to happen so i'm trying to demystify what is this technology today with dennis rothman and it's an honor for me to have dennis rothman in my podcast and thank you so much for giving me a podcast dennis well then thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak <laughs> yes. so maybe you want me i can start with some basic uh, ideas and then you can ask me questions yeah so the the first evolution goes back uh to the 1980s when you can imagine let's say you have a function let's take a simple mathematical function we say y equals ax plus b we've all seen this kind of equation well, we can even simplify it we can say y equals a times x okay y equals a times x so if I, if i tell you y y equals 2 times some something you can say let's say y is 4 and then i say 4 equals 2 times something everyone's going to find it's 2 2 times 2 equals 4 right so you say y equals w times x right and then i say x is 2 and y is 2 and then you know that uh w is 1 right so it's very easy when we had these old equations so we could write rules in our in a, a set of rules saying if i see for example two eyes in a face and a nose then it's a then it's a human being uh if it if the eyes are like this or it could be an animal or so we had these rules but then as the years got by gone by the data became huge and the world became more complex like the supply chain so you supply chain where you can purchase something for example a uh, fabric in india send it to uh, a country where it will be manufactured conditioned sent to europe and then sent to the united states so the world became more complex so writing these rules became too difficult it became too difficult because then you would have to write hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rules so we were thinking how can we solve this problem what if i say y equals w times x but let the system find what w is let's say y equals 10 and then x equals uh 5 and then let the system find w by itself so then it'll try 1 2 3 4 5 and then it'll it'll find a good value and that's where deep learning and machine learning started it's just when we couldn't find the rules anymore and we said forget it i'm not going to write the equation i'm just going to let it find i'm going to give the values and it will find the intermediate values now if you expand that well then you have a deep learning network you can say well then i have one layer two layers three layers and let it find all the values so that in the end that it will say that's a person or that's a dog or that's a cat So that's that's how it started. Yeah, you know, my questions will be more uh kind of a technical and a kind of a philosophical one. So yeah, let's get it started. So you mean like the philosophical aspect of building a machine? Yep. Kind of. Well, then uh, the other thing you can speak about is these equations were all written by 1950. Everything was already written. Yeah. You had Alan Turing, you had uh, Claude Claude uh, Shannon. You have a lot of people that wrote about all this the Newman. All of this was in place, but then once again, you can really see when it really started is during World War II with Enigma. You, the 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 Germans had a code and the we the, the allies wanted to decode it. And to decode it, you needed a lot of power. So you started with humans And then Alan Turing said, "Why don't I take a machine and I see that a machine can do everything a human can't do?" So it's just 
like um, cars helped us go faster on roads and then machines got us faster in thinking. So that's the philosophical aspect. And then you can go a few decades later and you get back to my first part where I say there's so much data that we need, we need, we need some help from artificial intelligence, not all the time, but sometimes. So my question is always on, we have never experienced what is real intelligence all about. So I just want you to give a note on what is real intelligence all about to you. Oh, well, oh yeah, well, intelligence. So intelligence for me, right, is only a method to solve a problem. Like let's take a crow, you know, the bird, the bird, the big black bird with his beak that no one likes. Well, it's a very intelligent bird. <clears throat> so if you give it, it finds, you give it a glass of water and then the glass is not full of water. It, it can't put his beak in the, in, the, in the glass. So it'll go get some stones and I'll put the stones in the glass until the water goes up to the top and then I'll drink it. So that's, that's an algorithm, that, that's an algorithm. And then you have ants, you have little ants running around and they want to get things. Or you have uh, monkeys, monkeys have a lot of strategies uh, in Indian cities. Uh, monkeys are extremely intelligent. Uh, they, they have all these strategies where they'll, they might catch your intention while another one takes your bag or takes some food. Uh, you find their strategies in Africa as well. So then you get to humans. Humans, we have uh, overdeveloped brains. So we find we found more strategies than even the monkeys or the ants or the crows. We found many, many ways to hunt them, to eat them, to farm. So we developed a form of intelligence which cannot compute that much. We don't have that much computing power. So that's where our instinct and our emotions come in. That's when we say, oh, we have creativity. Of course we have, because that's, we need it because we can't do all the calculations. And then, then on the other side, you have machines. Now machines, they have a, a tremendous computer power. So they don't need our form of intelligence. They don't need to find shortcuts. They can just do brute force. They can do the little equation, like I said, uh, 1,407,052 equals X times two, but it, it can go and try all the combinations. It doesn't have to think, it, it needs no reasoning. So the computers have, a, have an intelligence, but it's machine intelligence, it's not human intelligence. And there's no reason to try to say it's going to be human one day or it's gonna have consciousness. All this is science fiction, right? It's in the minds of people, it's like saying my pocket calculator is going to wake up one day and it's going to talk to me. So this morning uh, I woke up and wow, after 100 years of pocket calculator, it evolved. And now it says hello to me and it's sad, it's happy, it's ridiculous. It's like cars, we have cars, cars don't talk to us or they can, but they're not intelligent words, but we use them. So I would say intelligence is a form of solving a problem. You have machine intelligence, human intelligence, insect intelligence, uh, all kinds of intelligences. Yeah, I know that clears a lot of thought process on what intelligence. So here's a thought process where we have never experienced intelligence, but we have seen it making an influence in our life. Let it be you saying the story of the crow. Of course, it's kind of a bedtime story for all the young folks here. So yeah, and also about the ant, you know, there are a lot of ways in which uh, swarm intelligence and all these are coming up. So yeah, you know, Nature has somehow influenced us in some or the other way. So yeah, let's just move on. And I just wanted to ask you this one question. Who, according to you, is the greatest researcher in the deep learning? Ah, I don't, uh, the greatest researcher in deep learning. I think, honestly, we have to go back to Yann Lequin. That's, that's Y-A-N-N and then L-E-C-U-N. He is the one who really, deep learning existed before, but he, he worked on it when no one believed on, in it. And it's in the 1980s and he did it in his uh, PhD. And then he went to work 
for banks, and then he became the head of research of Facebook. He's the one that really developed all the intel artificial intelligence in Facebook. So I would say that really, he's the, the one that took the most risks. Of course, you have people like Hinton and all that, but he's, he's quiet. You don't hear about him in the media. He's not talking about going to Mars. Uh, he's a hard worker, but he, he put the math together and, and it was used in banks in, in the 1980s, like to recognize checks when you're written checks with machines. So, but there is no such thing as one big one. I just wanted to mention him because he worked a lot, but there's no such thing as the biggest researcher. It's always collective. There's no such thing as a one researcher. So I would say all of these people that worked on it are, are uh, helped to help deep learning go forward. Now the latest, of course, the best, the most innovative team I found is uh, Google uh, Brain and Google Labs and Research when they invented the transformer in uh, 2017. They really changed uh, deep learning programs because by introducing attention, and uh, let me tell you what that means. You, before we had deep learning networks, like we see with layers, right? And we have all these layers. But none of these layers are the same size. You have the filter labor, convolutional, and then you have the dropout, and then you have, uh, hold on a minute, then you have the dropout, and then you get to, they're not one of these layers are the same. They're not, they're all different. You go into rec in a recurrent neural network, what it does, it takes a sequence, and then it keeps going back to see what happened before so it can draw some conclusion. Oh, there's A, so we're going to B, ah, B, then we're going to C, ah, C, we're going to D. So it goes like this in a sequence, but then it builds up so much data that, that in memory, it's, it's too big. And then the, the best, the most, uh, the, the, the most in, smartest thing I found is in these transformers, they just said, let's forget about traditional deep learning. Let's forget about sequences. Let's make every block the same size. Everything is the same size and everything virtually does the same thing. And let's pile them up like bricks in a house. And let's for forget about going back in sequences. Let the system analyze what it wants inside with attention, you know, all the combinations and come out with something. So I would say in recent history, I would say Google is probably the most inventive and then you have uh, OpenAI who picked it up and Facebook, all, everyone picked it up after, but they found it first. So I would, I would say teams, there are some nice teams, Google, uh, Amazon, uh, Facebook, OpenAI, Microsoft, IBM. You, you have these nice laboratories because we always think of the billionaires, but in the offices, it's people like you and me. You're just sitting there trying to find something. So there's just normal people that find these incredible things. So I would say teams. I agree with you because it's not, it's not Google is not known by Sundar Pichai to me because he's just a CEO who is sitting in his cabinet making decisions. But I know Google because of Lawrence Barney. I know Google because of all these people, uh, all these people who have been influential in getting the right frameworks out, open sourcing it, developing it, like Rajat Monga, all these guys. You know, I'm pretty amazed because these are the people who are revolutionizing the way in which technology has to be used. So let it be in terms of uh, NLP models, which were built using the word to vectors or anything, you know, it's all the team which does the work. So yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Dennis. You know, I just want to ask you this question based on where it's actually a kind of a, of a dilemma to me because we never know which is the most hardest part of doing in deep learning, whether it's NLP or vision. So I just want to ask you this question, which is much more harder? Is it the language or else is it the vision? Honestly, uh, everything's simple. <laughs> it's, it's, the, the thing is, uh, the problem uh, we have as developers, uh, when we develop, we have this intuition where we're used to typing code and something happens. 
and then we download libraries and we run them and we just like to play around with code right it's like we like to, let's say compare we like to drive cars we like to get in the car and run it and get the feel of it and all that but to get into deep learning the best thing is to do some math if you do some uh, calculus there are some uh, easy courses uh, you need just basic you don't need much math you just need basic calculus, like uh, what's a derivative, uh, what's an integral. It, it, I would say it's a 10 hour, uh, if you, you find a good course, it's 10 hours or 20 hours, let's say 50 hours. What, what's 50 hours in a life? So the math doesn't go that far. You can get through it with a derivative and a partial derivative, right? I can say, uh, if I'm going upstairs, Let's say we're going up some stairs. I'm going upstairs one at a time. So I have a derivative of one. If I go upstairs two stair steps at a time, I have a derivative of two, right? But then I can just watch the distance I'm going or there are different ways. So I would say with simple math, once you have that, all that looks easy. Because what looks difficult is when we look at it, how does it do that? But it's so simple. If you have calculus and just matrix multiplication, multiplying a matrix, which is an array by another array. And you have these tutorials on the web where you just, uh, I would recommend taking a, a Python tutorial on the web and look at all the multiplications that are possible between variables and matrix and run them in Python until it's clear. And then run uh, some derivatives, see how that works, simple stuff. And once you have that, Deep learning is just, you know, it's very easy to understand because it's just filtering, multiplying, finding, it's just goes back to our Y times WX, finding the W. So that's all it is. So once you understand these filters and then the gradient, uh, the gradient, how it works, what, so it's worth taking some time doing the simple math. I would, once you have that, NLP is easy, everything's easy in there. I mean, it's just piling up a lot of layers and blocks. You know, it's, it, it's like when you learn how to count in grammar school, once you know how to count, you can count everything. So then you can say, is it easier for me to count packs of candy or it's easier to put books? I say, just learn how to count and that's it. So basic mathematics, okay? There are some nice courses on Udemy. I, if you look at my profile, you can see, I, I go do them regularly. Every year I go back and I do all the math again just to make sure I'm not missing. You can see in my profile, I have a certification, a certific a certif a certification for uh, math for AI. It's very cheap. It lasts 10, 20 hours, and it's a good reminder for everyone. Everyone, as soon as we leave school, we begin to forget things. So every year for, the pa for all my life, every year I go back and I do all the math again. Yeah, no, I also do that because, of course, we have work, we have a lot and lot of things to be done, but, you know, we... Intent to but there's a, the second part, there's a second part to your question that's also interesting is you say, should I start with computer vision or NLP? Now let's take it from the, another perspective. To do NLP, you have to do something about linguistics. Of course, you live in India, so you don't know it's very easy for you because you master so many languages and you see so many languages. No one has an idea of how many languages there are in India. So you speak English at least and you at least speak Hindi or something. So, and you might speak a third language. So for you, NLP has seemed so easy, but for a person living in France or the United States who's used to just one language, it's more difficult, but you need some linguistics. What is grammar? What's vocabulary? And when you're talking about computer vision, you don't need artificial intelligence for everything in computer vision. There were very simple algorithms that can identify license plate or a face. So we have to see what can be rule-based and where you need artificial intelligence coming from the subject matter expertise saying, no, no, to do that, you don't need a deep learning program. So there's some expertise. No, that's true. That's true because it's all about the deriving the equations, getting the stack of layers and getting that layer working proper. So yeah, that's what today's deep learning is all about. It's all related to how you our coding and compiler and how we are actually not compiler actually we are more reliant on the python interpreter so yeah so that's what it is all about
so we it's not that complex it's not that easy also because understanding frameworks also takes a lot of time because you yourself said that you go back and see a lot of math behind it so yeah it's kind of a complex kind of an easy so uh, yeah you you brought up another subject yeah there's a third dimension you're right to bring it up there was the math there's the subject and then i didn't realize that there's the framework but and the computers and the os operating system but the thing is i started out with a zx81 with a little just a little chip and with this chip we had no screen we had no mouse we just had this tiny electronic keyboard and it was an assembly and i started from that so little by little i was programming an assembly then when dos came along i was very happy then when i tried apple then i tried unix linux so i've been in, th in this so long that I, i i just learned the frameworks and the operating systems all of them as they came along i was in the apple catalog ibm catalog uh, so i just learned it all the way so when i get to today tensorflow uh, pi to all that seems very easy to me because i saw i saw them you know be be created it's very but you're right the people that are learning it now have to learn the math the language and the, and the subject true because yeah and also i just wanted to ask you this one question because what's the limitation for deep learning today and what's the current limit of entire deep learning pipelines that we are working on what's causing that limitation in order to give us that new standard or the new breakthrough in the research which we are doing today now there now there's two dimensions to your question now one one is a very interesting one is i found that once you go through all the books because i spend a lot of time reading every single paper and the the top books on amazon in my field i read i don't read only my books i read all the books are around at one point so there there are two aspects at one point I'll, it's like in a science fiction movie i get to the other side of artificial intelligence uh, it's like an image you know like in a science fiction movie i read it and i read it, then i get beyond it and you find when you look back that artificial intelligence can't solve all your problems you you, you can't if you're if you're trying to to calculate the temperature that's in here you don't need artificial intelligence you need physics you need physics you need equations that say well the temperature was at that temperature and it i measured it 2 minutes after so it's going down you don't need artificial intelligence so what i found when you get to the other side of artificial intelligence in deep learning you need other things you need the theory of complexity which is emerging how do you put the world together you know how do how uh, internet of things how do they fit together connected things so art of what we find is the limitation of artificial intelligence is artificial intelligence because there's a limit to it you can't do everything with it i can't marry artificial intelligence i can't drive artificial intelligence i can't eat artificial intelligence i mean th th what we don't what you have to realize is artificial intelligence represents that in our lives and no matter how you try to expand it it won't go anywhere in even if you put robots put all the robots you want they need electricity they consume energy they have to be maintained the maintenance on robots costs a lot of money so people that are saying that artificial will tell take over the world what are they going to take over the weather you think the weather is going to be artificial intelligence look at the power of the weather or the power of climate change so artificial so you get to the other side of artificial and you find that deep learning is reaching a limit where it does, it's just useless it does, there are other things in life than than deep learning then inside the need for deep learning so where deep learning is absolutely necessary for example or machine learning is on social media where they need to control uh the content more and more and more and more uh if you take uh facebook uh, twitter for example just these two they didn't realize what they were creating these guys were happy they had these social media when they were so happy to have a lot of people and become billionaires but now they're, they they've created something it's out of control even for them when they say i don't know they're honest they don't control it anymore so they try to to close an account or do something 
they don't have they don't have enough power. There's there are human beings doing that. When an account is closed, it's a human being that did it. So we'll need deep learning to go further. And the the limit, uh, I would say, the limit today of deep learning is more rules to insert more rules inside of it. it not which they do. You know, Google does that on YouTube, or uh, they have rules. They don't only have artificial intelligence. It's, you have rule base combined. So I would say the next breakthrough, you have the transformer, which is pretty powerful. And the next step is what I say in chapter six on my books on transformers are the methods you use to create the data sets. The data sets are like teachers. You have to teach the deep learning program. So I would, I would put an emphasis on creating good data sets, very intelligent ones. Today, they just it's, it's a lot of brute force. But now we need to think of getting good teachers for these deep learning. Uh, if you find the good teachers, they learn well, the good images, the good text. So um, I would say it's pretty advanced and it will advance, of course, uh, through the years. But then we have to consider the whole picture, everything that's around it. Yeah, hey, you know, you talked about physics. There are laws of physics which was being uh, demystified from a neural network. You know. We are trying to build neural networks in such a way that it can solve the unsolved nonlinear equations that we were actually uh, finding it difficult also. So I just want to ask you a question related to insights and also about the intent, because you have worked in almost of all the problem statements that, in, that this industry can see. It can be vision, it can be AI, it can be expandable AI, it can be transformers that you are recently written on. So I just want to ask you this question. Can we really build a neural network to give insight and an intent? What, what do you mean by intent? Uh, of course, you know, in the- You mean implementation in companies? Intent. No, no, intent in like, uh, intent for the thoughts, which it's saying, or anything related to, uh, how to... You mean intent like in the sense in chatbots, the intent? Yep, a kind of. The intent, because intent is a, such a powerful world, word, yeah. you know. First of all, uh, the intent, well, in a chatbot, the intent uh, of a sentence means what are you using it for, right? So what is the mean, what, what are you going to use this this part of the chat board for like the intent is uh do you want to help the person buy a pizza or do you want the person to rent a, a house that's the intent in uh yeah, a chat but also but also i'm speaking in terms of we building it just like a human being you know we, we don't uh, yeah, okay, we, well then, okay we actually well then, can do multiple tasks at a time so yeah okay so now if you're speaking about human beings and machine we go back to the early in the conversation, there is a problem. There is a problem here that is not new, uh, that is trying to make a machine look like a human. So it goes back so far in history, I wouldn't even go back that far. But what I'm saying is, let's take go back to a car. Now, you go out of your house tomorrow morning and you see your neighbor has a car. And his car is so powerful, he'd like it to look like a human. So he puts some hair on top of the car. And then he puts some legs uh, next to the wheels. And then he puts, uh, you know, some uh, arms on the hood. And he decorates his car like a human being. What will happen? You will call a hospital. And someone will come with an ambulance. And he'll pick the guy up. And I'll take him to a hospital and he'll stay there until he can come out and leave his car alone. Now, I think it's exactly the same thing with machines. So if you go into a factory that's manufacturing cars automatically, uh, I live in France and one of the first uh, automatic factories I visited was in the north of France where there was nobody in the factory. And that's maybe 20 years ago. But these robots were just robots, their arms going up and things going down. No one tried to make them look like an android or a human. Uh, okay, 
So, but if I went into that factory and I saw that they had dressed up all these people, all their robots in clothing and that they put hair on top of the, I would walk out of the factory. So the question is, are human, uh, human beings, do they have a psychological problem, a psychiatric problem trying to do this? So I would say, keep human beings out of these machines completely, except there's only one case where I see it's useful. It's like in Japan, when they want to help elderly people uh, because there are not enough people to care for elderly people. So you can have a little Android robot that comes in on his little wheels. And, but I think it's good as long as it doesn't look too much like a human, it, you, that the person can see, oh, it's funny. This little thing coming in with wheels and it goes beep, beep, beep with all these lights. It's funny, but it's not a human because you don't want an elderly person to think that's a human because they do have cognitive problems. So I see very limited cases where you want to do that, but I don't see the use. Human intelligence is not powerful enough to be used in artificial intelligence. Or let me give you an example. There is not a single human being on this planet, including Magnus Carlsen, which is the world chess champion that can beat the chess algorithm any chess algorithm, and there's no artificial intelligence in chess algorithms, or just, I mean, 1%. There's not a single hum human can that beat a chess engine. So human intelligence is very limited. So I don't see how we can progress in terms of intelligence by using uh, human intelligence. Human intelligence is good to design the machine, but once you have this chess engine, well, try to beat it. No human being can beat one. No human can do math as fast as a supercomputer. No human can go as fast as deep learning to recognize 1 million images and classify them with deep learning. No. So human intelligence is very good to create tools. So we created cars, but we're not trying to make cars look like us. Why are we? So we're just, what I say very often is we have an ego problem. It hurts our ego to find that a chess engine with practically no artificial intelligence that can beat us completely with simple math. Oh, it's, it's like a pocket calculator it doesn't think like a human, but it beats us. So I think we should not try to do this except in very specific situations where it can help disabled people or elderly people, I would say in, in a medical sense. Yeah, but what led to the success of this entire community flow, which is just going behind deep learning and machine learning, what really led that, led that, you know, it's all about, it's not about the algorithm also, it's not about the fascination about uh, rebuilding something Android or something, but I want to ask you this question, like, what was the key idea that led to the success of deep learning? You mean what led to deep learning? Yep. And also what is making it more successful today? Well, uh, it, it goes back to early in our conversation. Uh, there are subjects for which we can't find the rules. Like uh, let's, we've been talking about faces, cats and dogs, but what if I find, let's say, I want to classify 1000 plants. 1000 plants of different sizes that come from different continents how many rules are I going to have to write? I mean, uh, it's, so you give me 1,000 plants in 1 million images and all sorts of sizes and varieties and different colors and lights. And now I want to recognize them because I want to have a camera going in, I don't know, and analyzing how many of these plants have been disappearing with climate change. So I want to roll a little video somewhere and it will detect all the plants that are there today. And then I go back in a year and I say, where are they now? Imagine how much time it would with a piece of paper, looking at all the pictures. Okay, so we have now 1000 hours of video or 1 million images and we're gonna look at them by hand in a little album. So it might take us, I don't know, 10 years. 
then we can say, oh no, I'll take, I'll do it with rules, computer vision, bing, 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 bing. Wow. I wrote uh, 500 rules today. In, in 10 days, I wrote 5,000 rules. The thing is that rule 1,000 contradicts rule 4,000, so it, it makes a mistake. So I have to go back to all the equations again. You know, this, there's, you know, this happened to Einstein. Einstein worked two years and he found a mistake in his math that went back very far and he had to start all over again asking a friend to help him. So this is a, and a genius. So that's where deep learning comes in very handy because you can say, oh, no, 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 go find the rules. I mean, go find the patterns yourself. I, so these are fantastic. I mean, it's a fantastic tool when you need to do something like that. So that's where the motivation came saying, well, it, we've reached our limit, but this can be very helpful. Like uh, IBM uh, wrote a program uh, to detect uh, skin cancer on, on skin, uh, on skin. So they just, they could treat, maybe look at uh, process thousands of images and see things that we wouldn't see with the, with the bare eye, you know, something that go, ah, and the person, the doctor says, I didn't notice that detail. You're right. That is a problem because you can be tired. So there's very, the, in, the it goes back to your intent and necessity. That's very helpful. That, that can be very helpful as an aid, not to replace. So now you can see where it really counts. Uh, if you're looking for cancer cells, if you're looking and there's so much to analyze, it's very helpful. Yeah, but like, what's the big deal with the AI alignment and what's it all about in the future? Because everything is going vague in terms of AI alignment and everything. So what's your view on AI alignment? So I would say that, um, <clears throat> let's put it this way. AI is a fantastic marketing tool, okay? So let's say you're watching television and you're watching advertisements for cars. I, I like I like I like everything that goes around cars because everyone has one or has seen one or has a neighbor that has a car. Even if we have a bicycle today, we know what a car is. So we look at these advertisements of cars. And who speaks about cars? They're speaking about, oh, there's this beautiful woman in the car and she's driving. And I just came out with my my car, my mug here. And she looked at me from that car. So a few midges later, you see the man in the car. Wow. So what is being sold here? Uh, love. So you could get the illusion that you're not buying a car, you're buying love. So, and then if you look at, if you take all the advertisements, you can find that you're speaking about cars that much and, and, and you're speaking about something else that much. And that's what artificial intelligence is in media. People have blown it totally out of proportion in terms of what it really does. It's not, it's used in a, in, let's say in, in a corporate pipeline, let's say you have this corporate pipeline, artificial intelligence is used that much, even at Google, even on YouTube. There's a lot of work to put the, to, to manage the videos online. There's big data. You have big data to manage. You have yeah, Google has all these tasks to manage to keep the videos on and then artificial intelligence is just a small part. So in the future, artificial intelligence will be a good tool. That's it. Yeah, you know. And of course, uh, people like to, to capitalize on the hype, which is very good for you and for me to get a job, to sell books. It, it, it's, it's a nice, it gets people funding. It has made artificial intelligence popular. It, Hype is not a bad thing, you know, it, it gets things moving and then you see it in the movies, then it, it, people say, oh, why don't I do that job? Hype can be very positive to, 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 to push people forward, but it's hype. Yeah, until it's not our hope to solve any problem statement that we are relying on. Yep, that's true. That's true because until and unless we hope that this will be the magic solution it's not going to be that because it's no, 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 a set no, no, of code. No, there's, no, 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 no. You will see in the next few years when 5G, you know, the, the on mobiles expand, 
we'll be speaking a little less by artificial and about artificial intelligence and more about connect connected devices because with 5G everything's going to be connected and it's going to it's going the, the data we have today is is going to go up exponentially and at the same time we'll be processing it with artificial intelligence and other algorithms but that data is going to change our lives 5G the internet of things is really the big big thing and uh, the internet connections like the fact that we're connecting with zoom uh, connections the word connect is much more powerful than the word artificial intelligence if you apply it to everything you see yeah you know i can get that i can get this but no we talked a lot about uh, ethics we talked a lot about how it's been hyped up and we also talked a lot about how it's a marketing strategy but like you know there's a huge way in which industry has seen the changes you know let it be in terms of the versions of the frameworks we had tensorflow 1x now we have tensorflow 2x which is like revolutionizing the entire deep learning scenario which we are actually in terms of development yes that's for sure so i just want to ask you this question based on gpt2 and gpt3 how different are they so now we're going back to so transformers so everyone for some reason i don't understand everyone speaking about gp2 gpt2 and gpt3 okay google created the transformer in 2017 and then open ai which is controlled by microsoft did the gpt2 and the gpt3 which is very interesting because gpt3 I speak about this in chapter 6 in my book on transformers is was they trained it with a 10 million dollar supercomputer with 10,000 GPUs around 30,000 CPUs no one has that kind of equipment you know uh, it, it's a supercomputer it's one of the biggest in the world so if you have 10 million dollars then you can train it so then they were saying well we're we're getting out of funding so they say let's get microsoft in here and they said well we can't give it to you gpt3 is not on github we're going to have to rent it because we need some funding for all that which which is a normal thing to do and they're saying you will we'll, we'll see it appear in microsoft azure well you can rent it and and use it there and, and we're not giving to every to everyone but it because it's so powerful okay and it and it's i describe it in chapter 6 but if you go to my book and you read the introduction of chapter 6 you will find that on the super glue leaderboard still at this minute when i'm speaking gpt3 is around i would say position 14 or 15 on the nlp super glue leaderboard which is a very serious ranking it's 14 so what happened what happened is people don't have that money so it goes to back to my conversation where i say you have to teach the system so people that don't have all that money or the, or labs that want to make it more popular focus on the data on the way you train it so you have in i describe it in the beginning of chapter 16 a 6 chapter 6 excuse me uh, a, a method called pet okay which is pattern extracting training where a phd student in germany took a, a, a computer like we have and say i don't have all that money i'm going to have to think harder so why don't i find a way to tweak the data so it'll learn so fast and it beat gpt3 with only a few examples in the data set because now now you're going to say so and it beat it with just an albert model a very small model so it it beat gpt3 So people are going to say now because oh GPT-3 is bad then. No, GPT-3 is interesting because OpenAI is reading all OpenAI listens to podcasts like that. They're reading books like mine. They've read, they've seen and say, "Oh, we're going to do that too to the data sets." Pretty soon you're going to see an article where they're going to be training it with with they're going to say our GPT-4 model now only requires a laptop because we're working on the data. So If you put all that together it goes back to the teamwork. You have someone like GPT-2 that has built this fantastic model, then someone came along with less data, and then GPT-3 so let's do a GPT-4 will be a mini GPT 
which will work better than the G so it's just it's just a progression i would say gpt3 is nice it's just a step in this technology uh, progression yeah it it was a progress that we ever saw because we can't afford that amount of compute so we started relying on it but it's not open source yet yeah that's true but i just want to ask you this question how long does it take to finish a book of course writing and reading you were actually an audience once and you are an author now so how long does it take to complete a book writing and to reading. write a book yep okay now i, I i'm not uh, i'm a little special case because uh, i've been doing artificial intelligence all my life and every day every day of my working career and now i spend between 2 and 4 hours per day learning i never stopped learning even when i was managing teams i'd say well well it's 4 p.m. over for me i'm studying now i'm going on the internet i'm reading books so don't bother me with operational stuff cuz this pr- learning gives you better techniques so in the morning i have better techniques to go faster so since i have everything up here because uh, every day i learn and i have it's by heart i have everything up here so let's take a book like the transformers what i did is i read all the papers i read all the papers and as i told you i'm pretty good in math so i got all the math uh, honestly i can read these papers like i read comic books okay so uh, there's no effort after 40 years you know it's it, there is no effort so i generally i write a book between two and a half months and uh, four months tops so transformer explainable ai here Uh, was written in two months and a half. This one transferred two months and a half, and this one in four. Artificial intelligence was four months. And I can write a book. Uh, I can write if I'm really in shape. I can write a chapter a day. If I'm really in the flow, but then I can't go that fast what slows me down why do, so why does it take me the question is why does it take me 2 months it takes me 2 months because i write all the programs myself and i test all the programs so it's not the writing i'm 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 testing a lot and i'm running i'm a bit crazy so i'll run them 100 times and in my transformers book i didn't want to take uh, ready to use libraries and say just type that i wanted to go deep like for gpt 2 uh, I really took the the GitHub uh, repository which is not very practical uh, at all. I could have taken hug, hugging face and write two lines and that's it. No, I wanted people to suffer to go find the library and then try to get it back to TensorFlow 1 and rerun the notebook and go a bit crazy using it. So I, I like the mechanic part. So that takes me a bit longer and I like to check all the math. even if someone wrote a paper i want to be sure he's not making a mistake in his own paper of course from time to time i do find little uh, glitches even in these famous papers so it takes time for quality control you know you take less time to write a book that's amazing because you know it takes years together for people to write books so yeah i think probably you are the biggest motivation to the future authors who are thinking okay i need to write a book i have the experience i think probably you're going to be that one big motivation to them yeah like speaking so about someone wants to write a book what he has to do is master the subject first learn everything by heart and then have his maybe 10 ideas or 12 ideas of chapters and then it, it'll it'll go but i i i honestly i've always been like that when i was in the the sorbonne when i was in the university you would have 4 hours for something i was i was often out out of 30 minutes i mean 30 minutes into the exam i was out some sometimes i i was short on time for very difficult exams you know you were saying i'm never going to make it i'm never going to make it but it's tension so sometimes i get the you know the tension i'm not going to make it but in fact if you in the days i don't have tension then it's maybe you know 30 minutes an hour instead of 4 hours why why because in the summer before the year i read all the books of the year and i studied the whole year before starting the year that was my trick 
There's no secret. I'm not intelligent. I'm just a hard worker. So in the summer, I would be reading all the books, all the courses, everything, studying it, learning by heart. So when I got into day one, I never needed to take notes. I would just listen to the teacher and get some ideas and all, but I, I, I had already finished my year before starting it. You know, I just want to ask you this question. What's the most beautiful and the most intuitive concept that you have come across in your life? It can be anything in deep learning, business, or any concept that has really influenced you. Like, I should be reading it. So I'll tell you, it's very, it's personal, but I would say religion. The concept of uh, something superior to us, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, um, uh, Islam, Catholic, Jewish, whatever you want. And all of these, the, the common point between all of these beautiful things is one time a man sat there and he said, there's something above us. We are not the top of the food chain. It, we're humble. So, um, in every country where these religions were built, um, a man or a woman or a child, I don't know, woke up and said, there's something above us. I feel it. There's something above us. And the concept is so ab abstract because you've never seen it. You can have 50% of the population that thinks it doesn't exist. And if 50% of the population thinks it exists. So it's abstract, it's total abstraction. And this abstraction for people that think about it is so powerful that it, it, it is the most beautiful thing because it's abs pure abstraction. Like uh, it, it's pure abstraction. There's something beautiful about it. Uh, wh whatever religion it is, it, it's always been there's something above us. And for a human being to be modest enough to wake up in the morning and to say, ah, there's something above us. So I do have something to learn. And I'm not, you know, the king of everything. There's something above us. I'd say, honestly, there's nothing more powerful on earth than that concept that there is or could be, whether, whether you believe it or not. But what I've noticed that when someone is in a bad situation, they at the hospital or in a car accident, they say, if you exist, we'll do something now. So people don't believe in it. But when something happens, if you exist, it's time to. So I think that's the most, the biggest concept. And then, then, if you go down to a, a lower level, if you come down to a lower level, then so I would say all religions. Uh, I'm not giving one religion, uh, I'm not saying one religion is better than the other. I, I think everyone in each continent had the same thought of something above us. So I think that all are beautiful. Then if you go down a bit, you know, you, you come down to earth more to your question, there's a, I would go back to uh, Immanuel Kant, Kant, the German philosopher, which I mentioned in chapter three of my book on transformers, because he's one of my favorite philosophers. He comes along and he says, you know, space and time, that doesn't exist. It's something we're invented because before humanity existed, could some, where was space and time? I mean, it's just a concept. So you have the concepts of space and time. If you think about it, so for us, it's obvious, but, but it's not obvious. It's not obvious at all. It's, it, it could be a construct. So it can be a construct. So if you come down, you now have space and time. That's incredible. If you think about how man in, invented time, you know, to, we synchronized at five o'clock to talk to each other, five o'clock my time, which is 9.30 your time. Okay, so we synchronized. Wow, the first man that, or woman or child that thought of that say, you know, when the sun gets there, we, we should all get together. Yeah, but in how many suns? Oh, uh, well, we have 10 fingers and 10 suns. In 10 suns, we'll meet again, or in five moons. Time is a very powerful concept that we invented, you know, uh, in space, you know, it's, it's very nice. And if you come, if you go down lower, if you go down lower, then you find uh, the most power, 
another powerful concept, which is love. Tell me what you can do without love. You can't do anything about love. Obviously, we like each other. You know, you're smiling, I'm smiling. So we're having this conversation from two different continents. We're exchanging ideas. It's empathy. I don't limit love to two people. I, I say love goes into empathy where, you, you know, ideas are going through. This evening, you'll be thinking about all this and I'll be thinking about your questions because questions always get you to think. So love is very important because it leads to empathy. And then... Uh, there's a whole range of fantastic concepts, but you know it could be summed up. I would say uh, the thoughts all these people on different continents have about had about religion. Then you could put love in 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 position two, and then you have space and time because once you have space and time, everything it, it's done because you want to count the space, you want to count the time, so you want to organize the space in vectors. So you get Euclidean geometry, you want to organize time, so you get all the episodes of artificial intelligence. It's very easy. Once you play around with these concepts and its combinations, you can get to math because... Uh, so I would say I, I like these uh, three concepts in that order. The, 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 the people that thought of religions in the abstract sense, then love, and then space and time. Yeah, you know, when you told about love and everything, I thought of asking this question. What was the learning that you got from writing books? Uh, it can be your books or else reading books also might have influenced you. What are the thoughts about when you were writing and learning something from a book? Now, a book for me is the, there are different types of books. So I'll skip the books we read to have fun, you know, uh, just the fun books. Okay, let's, I'll talk about the, the seminal books, the books that, a book is the opportunity to meet someone you can't meet in real life. That, 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 you're meeting a person. When you're reading, you're meeting the author. Uh, you're, you're reading someone you, you can't meet that may, maybe for physical reasons because the person's the other side of the world or for time reasons because the person is dead and uh, for reasons you can't meet that person because he's too famous for one reason or another. So you're meeting someone and, and this, this person, if the person wrote well, then you can say, wow, that's something I never even thought. So it's, it's enlightening to, to meet someone. So reading a book by a good author is meeting that person. So uh, of course, uh, it, it goes back to my previous subject, uh, the, the previous question, the books that fascinated me uh, the most, of course, uh, in this order was like the Rig Veda. I don't know if you know the Rig Veda. I know them. Okay. I know them. The Up Upanishads. Upanishads are part of the Rig Veda. They are the most powerful ones. And then you have the writings of Buddha. You have Ramakrishna. You have uh, Vivekananda. You have uh, Sri Aurobindo that was in Oroville in the southeast of India on your continent, then you go to the Middle East, you have uh, the Quran, which is extremely rich in uh, ideas. Then you have the Bible, which goes with the, you know, if you put the Bible and the Quran together, you have three religions at, all at once. And then you have uh, African animism. Uh, I think animism uh, is interesting as well. So these, uh, these, are, these are so powerful. These books are so powerful. I mean, it's the experience of man in everyday life problems they had to solve, not our abstract problems. Now, if you go to more uh, intellectual books, of course, math. I mean, uh, the, the, the findings in mathematics and philosophy and history, I'm interested in so many subjects. So it can be music, it can be painting. Uh, I'm just looking at, for, at the author, uh, the author. So uh, of course, uh, I can give you one of the first books because uh, I was born in an American culture, and the first book in France that uh, really influenced, really got me thinking, is a book by an author called Albert Camus, Camus, C A M U S, called The Revolted Man. I really liked that because I was a teenager and I was in revolt, you know, and he wrote this. He's a very famous author, and The Revolted Man, and he shows how man through the centuries was revolting against everything that existed to create something else. 
And I like this idea of, you know, taking things apart and creating something new. So authors are the, books are the opportunity to meet people you can't meet. Or, or people that you met, but you didn't have time to talk to them or to get all the ideas. Yeah, that's true, that's true. But I want to ask you this question because it's long awaiting in my brain. So how secure AI is going to help us? What is it going to help the world? In which way is it going to take us to about the secure AI? So you mean what the security or yeah okay now let's take one of my favorite examples to illustrate this i'll change with cars let's take a knife well, look at what you can do with a knife with a knife you can cut your meat or if you're vegetarian you can cut your vegetables okay you can cut your carrots you can let's say you can cut your food okay so let, let's make it more general, whatever you are, you can cut your food. So you cut your food with a knife. That's, that's great. You can also be a surgeon. With a surgeon, you can open someone up and you can save his life. But if you're in the military, you can use a, a, a combat knife and you can kill somebody. Okay. And if you're an assassin, well, then you can kill somebody and steal what he has. So the question I can ask you is, what is the future of the knife? How secure <laughs> is a knife? A knife. How can we make knives secure? Okay. The only way you can make a knife secure is by making education secure. But no one, you can't stop anyone from taking a kitchen knife, going out in the street and killing five people. I mean, the, the, no way. E education. So... Uh, Artificial intelligence is a knife. You can use it to learn. You can use it. You can weaponize it. It's being weaponized by many countries uh, in cyber attacks. Uh, it's a weapon in itself, or it can be used in weapons, in tanks, in airplanes, or it can be used to find medicine. It's a knife. So, and 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 I'll take it a bit further. What about your hand? What what is the future of these hands? I can use them to type on my laptop. I can use them to cook some food, but I can also strangle you. I can strangle you and I can kill you. You can use your hands for that. Or I can beat someone up and kill the person. So what is the future of hands? If you go that, should I cut my hands off? Should people have gloves that stop them from using their hands? So part of the whole conversation about it is ridiculous because it's been going on for a hundred thousand years when the first person found something you know to open the animal up you know and, and eat it or cut some fruits to get what's inside it depending on what the person eats or it was just a simple stone when he found that with a stone you know he, he could break something but he could also break someone's head it's been there for 100,000 years. So are we going to solve a problem that's 100,000 years old? Well, I don't think so. That's a pretty cool way of giving something as an answer to the question, such a bright solution for it because there are a lot of people who have given me a lot and lot of interpretations about secure. Yeah, I think this is probably the most uh, smallest, the most... Uh, brightest solution for this question that I really asked you. So I think last few questions and I'll be winding up the podcast. So what are frameworks to you? Because we have been seeing frameworks getting mature. Of course, you have, you have started with your journey from assembly. So what are frameworks to you? Uh, frameworks, there's a, 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 let's go back to our knife. A, a, a framework is a two-sided knife. It can, it, can do, it can cut things very easily, but on the other hand, um, it can go too fast. So let's say, I, like in my book on uh, artificial intelligence, uh, I started out with a little, uh, a little network in, in just using, uh, I, didn't, I don't think, I think I use NumPy, but that's the maximum. I, I don't think I even use NumPy. I, didn't, I don't think there's NumPy in it. So I just, the first thing I would tell a person is try to build a little network, uh, a, a McCulloch-Pitts network with one neuron, just doing the math, 
so I, I did that. And then I add a second one to solve uh, a little problem that wasn't solved, but with one neuron, which is the XOR problem, which was the limit of the 1950 per spectrum, but let's not go into that. So I would suggest at least do it once. Take an Excel sheet, write all the, the weights, what they do, write it. And once you understand it, then use a framework because a framework can be very practical. Uh, there's no, no question about it. The pro you can build something in a few minutes where it would take a few months to do it without a framework. So it's, it would be ridiculous not to use a framework today. The problem you have with a framework is what do you, have, what do, you do with your programs when you go to TensorFlow 1 to TensorFlow 2? I won't say the company, but I, there's an aerospace company. I was doing this conference uh, a couple of years ago and the team came up to me and they said, Dennis, what do you think about what we're doing? And I said, what is it in? TensorFlow 1. I said, you know that TensorFlow 2 is making TensorFlow 1 deprecated? And they said, oh, so what do we have to do? You're gonna have to rewrite it because there's a compatibility thing, but it doesn't, it's not the real thing. You have to rewrite the code. I had to, I had, in my first book, Artificial Intelligence by Example, I used TensorFlow 1. I had to rewrite all the programs in TensorFlow 2 for the second book. Okay, so a framework is interesting, but when you're looking at long-term maintenance, you have to be careful. You might have to just download the framework and stabilize it in your corporation and not change it. It's, it's, it's pretty complex because then you become dependent on the person that sell, the, the people that sell the network or distribute it, or even if it's open source, it can change all the time. So it's a two-sided knife. Yeah, you know, but what about this big O notation that we give for an algorithm? There is an hardware which is not compatible to the problem statements that we are facing today. Let it be in medicine, let it be our new trend, the quantum computing that we are seeing. You know, it's a new hustle that it has bought in people because people are more energetic towards all these techniques. So what's that big deal with the big O notation that we have for an algorithm? The big what? The big machines or the big... Big uh, O notation, order notation. Ah, the big O. Yes. I don't... I'm, I'm pretty used to large numbers, so none of these O's impress me because the... the uh, let's go back 50,000 years, okay? Now, you can notice in my conversation that I'm explaining that humans have not changed with technology, right? You could... That's the over, overlying concept here that there's nothing new here. So if you go back 50,000 years and let's take the big O, okay? We're both together. Uh, it's uh, for you now, it's late in the evening. <clears throat> we don't have anything to eat. So tomorrow morning, we're gonna have to get up and we're hungry because we didn't eat much today. We gave it to our family, to our wives, to our children, to our friends. To... We're very hungry. And we know that if tomorrow we don't find food, then tomorrow evening will be weaker and by the end of the week, we won't be able to go out hunting anymore. So let's say we're hunters, okay? Let's say we're not vegetarians, okay? Say we're hunters. Now we have paths. We're going to have to go out in the forest and there are an incredible amount of paths you can take to reach the animal. So if you take a dumb hunter, a dumb 50, the dumb hunter 50,000 years ago is a dumb one. He's not intelligent. He, he doesn't, he'll never do artificial intelligence. He just goes on a path and he looks for an animal. If he doesn't find one, he finds another path. And after a week, don't worry, he's dead. So he's not our ancestor. <laughs> so he does, his intelligence didn't evolve. Then our ancestors, you and me, because we're still here, we're smarter. They're saying, oh, 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 big O. That's too much computing. I don't want to run around because I'm using up calories every time I go in these paths. So I have to find a shorter path. Now I'm going to think, where are the water points? Where is there water? Where there's water, there's animals. What time do they go and drink? What time do I have to get there before they get there? So I'm gonna say, why don't we go there at three in the morning, hide in a tree and wait until they come along in the morning and hit them with a spear or with a bow and arrow, okay? So that's big O. So no, that's why I'm telling you, I'm not afraid of big numbers, big large numbers, because you can always find a solution 
like the one that's in chapter six that I showed there with the pet thing where you can find a simple way to do a big thing. So when you see a big O, don't worry. There's always a better way to do it. In, in chess, for example, I'm, I'm a chess player and I, I took many, many lessons from uh, coaches, from uh, international uh, masters. And they said, you, find a good, you found a good move, Dennis. I said, wow, can I play it? No, 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 no. If you found a good move, there's a better one. So go find a better move now. And I find a better one. And I said, okay, can I play? No, 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 no. If you found that, there's still a better one. There's always a better one because you're just an average player. So there's, there's, there's about 20 better ones than the one you chose. So I would say the big O can be solved by our natural intelligence. That's where human intelligence comes in. We're not computers. We know from 50,000 years ago that people that do things that are too complex die. And that's where your question comes from. What's about the, all these quantum computers and all that stuff? No, 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 no. Did you see the movie in Indiana Jones? No. No. There, there's a famous scene where you have a guy coming with a sword and he's, he's saying, whoa, we, yo, you know, you see this in movies where someone saying, yo, ma, ho, yo. and on the other side, a guy takes a gun out and he says, and just shoot him with one bullet. Okay, so there's always a bullet that'll make things easier. So don't worry. I, I'd say if you see big O's, well, then there's a better way. Yeah, you know, thank you so much, Dennis, for clarifying all my doubts, which I had from quite a bit of time since I so started you did, doing. Did you ask all your questions? Yes, it was all my questions, which were crazy in my mind, just just waiting for some thought process to be given out by some of the other people whom I'm relying to give. So you are one of those persons. As soon as I heard about you from Tom Hives, you know, there was a kind of a fascination in me that, okay, I should meet this person. I should get all my doubts clarified. What is the thought process of his experience? I have to extract a lot and lot of thought process from you so that I can chisel up myself as a good engineer tomorrow. So yeah, you know, that's well, why I started the podcast. The takeaways for you, uh, I can see through our conversation, is always go back to very simple examples in humanity 20,000 years ago, because our brain here hasn't changed in 20,000 years. It's the same brain. So our ancestors built this brain, and they built it with complex calculations. Uh, they built it with the pathfinders in forests. So I would say always, and there's this uh, French philosopher called Descartes, D, uh, René Descartes, it's D-E-S-C-R-T-E-S. -E -E He's one of the famous person uh, in France that in, he was all over Europe. Geometry, right? Yeah, it's the method. It, it, always to break things down into simple things. Uh, that's my takeaway. Everything, anything that looks complicated is not well presented. It has to be broken down into little bricks. So if you break it down into little bricks, you'll solve any problem. Yeah, you know, thank you so much, Dennis, for this amazing podcast. I think it will be live very soon. So yeah, thank you so much, Dennis. Well, I hope it helps you. And then once it's on there, I'll put it in my playlist on YouTube, okay? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.